Uh, so hey, uh, everyone, welcome to um, OspoCon Europe. It's great to be here. Uh, Anne and I have the kind of opportunity of welcoming you to the event uh, this time around. We've been doing these for a while, and it's very excited to see everyone uh, face to face. It's been been a little bit long. So we'll introduce ourselves first. So Anna. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Anna. I'm uh, the to-do program manager. And uh, well, um, a little bit of myself, I was, formerly I was in another, um, Viteria, a software development analytics firm. And in there, I get a lot of knowledge on OSPO and inner source uh, metrics and community health. And then now, um, one part of my time is, uh, uh, making sure to grow and nurture the the community at to the group and help OSPOs advance in their OSPO journeys and uh, build uh, with the community guides, reports, and and other tooling uh, to run successful open source program offices. Uh, two years ago, I s finished my master in data science. Uh, focused on um, measuring the DevRel success on open source projects. And i have also involved in other communities like Chaos, Inner Source Commons, Open Chain, uh, DevRel Collective, and DevRel Spain. Thank you. Do a quick little intro uh, before we go to OSPO news. So, um, you know, uh, Chris Anizic had the fun job of helping build out and running the OSPO uh, at Twitter a, w a while ago. Uh, currently, I serve as CTO of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, which I helped start about seven years ago now, and I'm involved in a lot of the bootstrapping of open source foundations within within the Linux Foundation. Uh, I'm a co-founder of the Tudu Group and OSPOCon, and it's great to kind of see folks caring more about the prof professionalization of open source programs. You know, some of us who have been here for, you know, a while, like Nithya in the room, it's a, you, we've seen this evolve over the years, and it's kind of just great to see more and more companies having open source offices and just professionalizing uh, the, the practice across the industry. So first off, Anne and I want to thank the OSPOCon uh, Europe Program Committee. Um, you know, Chris, Stephen, you know, Libby, Joseph, Jordan, you know, Don, <laughs> Anna, David, and Cornelius were instrumental in helping us formalize a great program that we have for the next uh, few days here. So thank you. If there's any folks in here that are interested in participating next time, let us know. We're always happy to kind of grow. Uh, folks on, on the program committee side. So we'll do this quick little, uh, uh, you know, presentation about the value of OSPOs. We'll talk a little bit about updates from the Tudu group and some latest OSPO uh, news and there's our little little mascot. So I don't have to explain this uh, to, to hopefully folks in this room, but uh, in general, most modern uh, software that is developed these days is based on open source uh, you know, projects and technology. You know, uh, every open source summit you go to, it's always like new foundation around climate, new foundation around, you know, this thing. Every industry, everything that we're essentially touching on a daily basis has software being embedded, embedded in it, and more and more of that is becoming, uh, you know, open source. Uh, the challenge, you know, is not op all open source are necessarily equal. You know, some projects may be uh, a little bit more secure, more modern, more mature than others, and I think the role of uh, an OSPO and, and an organization is to basically, you know, what are the risks for you when you potentially use open source uh, incorrectly? You know, do you use a library that, you know, you may not comply with the license uh, because your developers accidentally dragged it into uh, a build or uh, a product because that's just the way it works. Developers are inherently lazy and just use what they could find. So um, a lot of common issues out there around oh, ensuring that we're, you know, making sure we're compliant and preventing those type of situations. Uh, also, the question asks is like, what is the cost if, you know, your organization does this, you know, poorly or incorrectly? If you have open source that is not secure and you're using it, does that put your organization as risk? We've had some huge incidents re uh, recently in industry with, you know, LogForge uh, definitely caused all sorts of issues, but, you know, there are more of the classic OSPO issues of, you know, you ship a GPL library in a mobile app that you didn't intend to, you know, dealing with those consequences, and there's been a lot of court cases and other kind of ramifications here. So these are just questions to kind of think about, you know, for, for your organization. And this is, like, not really a new concept. I always tell people, you know, a, a long time ago in the industry, the security... Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, security offices out there were formed in a reaction to people getting hacked. You know, people running into issues and having like their businesses basically severely penalized for that. So, uh, this, the role of the CISO was created, you know, a little over 25 years ago, and now we see almost every organization in this world having a 
basic CISO or security you know, center of competence. The same thing is happening with open source in my perspective, where open source now has become literally so pervasive, the formalization of an OSPO, an open source kind of officer, is, is, is happening through, throughout. So uh, the Tudor group maintains this little OSPO definition, which you know, essentially just you know, uh, tells you, you know, what the role of an OSPO is. Here are some of the things uh, we focused on. It's kind of a community-based things that we created. But essentially, an OSPO is very simple. It's really just the center of competency uh, in your organization to handle you know, open source operations. So it's basically it. Uh, a lot of companies do it differently. You know, sometimes OSPOs live in engineering departments. Sometimes they live in legal departments. There's kind of no one formula uh, for this. But you know, this is something we maintain to kind of help grow uh, the, the craft. Uh, you know, overall, um, you know, the other thing uh, that kind of uh, Ann and I, t uh, you know, talk about uh, a bit, and I've talked about it with a lot, a lot of folks, is literally, you know, you, you can't you, adopting a strategic posture on open source is no longer optional. You have to have it. Like all the stuff that your company or organizations are building on, it depends on open source. You have to truly think about, you know, what business value you're getting, what organizations you need to support, and so on. So things continue to kind of, you know, hum along. Uh, within a to-do group, we helped essentially, you know, build a couple models of how you could kind of think about this. But, you know, a lot of times when you're starting your kind of OSPO, you're basically moving from, you know, a lot of companies have some folks in their organization that care about open source. Maybe it's an engineer or whatever, you know, program manager. And, you know, these are very haphazard kind of ad hoc uh, efforts. Uh, starting an OSPO or a formal OSPO is basically moving this to a more strategic position that's funded in your organization, that is properly staffed, and pretty much delineates what clear business value and strategy um, that your, your organization gets from, from using open source. Um, OSPOs always kind of help educate and fuse uh, open source culture throughout the organization uh, out there, and you know, generally help accelerate the adoption of open source software, which uh, is the default um, you know, these days. So we came up with this uh, little um, you know, model of how kind of OSPOs get formed. You kind of have the early stage zero of just like, we're just using open source and we may have no idea what we're actually uh, consuming, which is very uh, common. And then there's kind of other stages that go along from, you know, formalizing, you know, legal, legal education and compliance efforts to more community outreach to engagement to actually leadership in, you know, producing open source software that uh, you're collaborating, um, you know, with, with peers in industry. So, you know, uh, lots of different things, and, you know, uh, we have a lot, a lot of these resources online of what OSPOs do, you know, um, a lot of people ask, but every OSPO is going to be a little bit different based on kind of what your needs are for an organization. There is not one clear way to do this. Like, you could learn from a lot of different OSPOs, but it's always going to be a little bit unique for your organization of what you actually kind of need and what you want to prioritize. So with that, um, you know, coming up and, and time is I'm going to go... Uh, hand it off to Anna to talk a little bit about latest OSPO news from the Tudu Group and some of the new stuff that we've uh, come, uh, come up with. Thank you so much. Yeah, so over the past months, uh, the Tudu community has been working on new resources, some great um, initiatives and programs together. And uh, today, I just wanted to, to give you some updates on what, what has been happening in, in the Tudu and the OSPO news so far. Uh, so the first uh, announcement is that uh, today we are launching the results from the past open source program office survey results. And it's already in the to do uh, blog, so people can go there, download the report in PDF, and also uh, check the um, main key findings that we, we have found. Uh, these are some of them. Um, I just wanted to highlight uh, two of them. The first one is around OSPO success. So this year, from all the uh, respondents that had an OSPO, 80% said their organization's programs have a really positive impact on software practices. So we are still we are seeing like clear um, results on what is to to build an OSPO in some organizations. Um, also, we're seeing uh, that uh, more than ever, uh, we're, we're seeing how success is being measured. So organizations are investing also in measuring the success by the volume of contributors and contributors, contributors coming from outside organizations. We're seeing some constraints. We've, we've tried to uh, segment also across different regions, like 
what is the OSP adoption in Europe? What is the OSP adoption in Asia Pacific? And for instance, in Asia Pacific, we are seeing uh, a big barrier to OSPOs, that is time and resource constraints. 40%, 49 percent uh, said uh, that was one of the main reasons of uh, don't have, not having an OSPO. Uh, so as I said, you can you can see the dive into these insights and, and key findings in the in the report we've just launched. And also, uh, now that we are outspoken in Europe, I just wanted to highlight this, uh, um, this finding we, we had uh, from European organizations, that 44% of European organizations said they never required or hire developers to work on open source projects. So that is a big issue uh, in terms of open source mentorship and training among organizations in Europe. I don't have the answer of how can we fix this. I would love to, to hear uh, your input on that. Uh, but maybe an OSPO that is this place where um, the organization can rely on and, and this uh, vehicle uh, where, uh, organi where um, they can translate uh, the open source uh, language uh, and infuse this to the whole organizations might be a, a, a potential solution to, to this issue of open source mentorship and training. Um, the next uh, new is that, well, uh, I'm sure some of you have heard about the, the to-do guides. Uh, I know some OSPOs already uh, knew about um, have used it in their for, for build the OSPO. So there is a new tutor guide and for outbound open source, and uh, we hope it's already also in the in the tutor uh, group dot org. And uh, it also um, uh, there is a link where people can uh, add their feedback and um, keep growing this guide and create the uh, version point two. So community feedback is more than welcome. And finally, um, we've been started a new series in person uh, roundtables and workshops called Ospology.live Sweden. The first one is hosted by OSPO at Ericsson. And this is a collaborative effort co-organized with all the open source communities that are helping the OSPO movement, XPDX, Tudor Group, Chaos, OpenSSF, and OpenChain. Uh, also, I've dropped you the link uh, to RSVP. The, um, the registration is now open, and that will be in October. Um, and finally, um, just to remind you that we are just starting the two steering committee uh, nominations for next year. Uh, first of all, big shout out to the current uh, two steering committee. They made my life way much easier. They have been great steering committee. Um, and there, uh, if you go to the Tutor Group's last governance GitHub repo, you will find everything about uh, the Tutor Student Committee responsibilities, uh, the, um, uh, what they do, and how this is selected. And the application form will close September 13th to um, become one of the candidates. And uh, I think I don't have too many times, so this is going to be really quick. We are an open community of OSPO practitioners uh, that are uh, willing to create knowledge, collaborate on best practices, tools, and other ways to run successful open source program offices or similar open source initiative, if you don't call it an OSPO. Um, we are now more than 1,800 community participants uh, and active. And we are also supported by uh, more than 80 general members, or organizations, well-known organizations worldwide, um, having an OSPO uh, in place. And um, in a nutshell, uh, we provide OSPO guidance and support in terms of tooling, network spaces, training, research, and education. And since I don't have time, I'm just passing. Yeah. <laughs> So you can go to todogroup.org slash guides and communities and everything I'm sharing here, you, you're going to find it for sure in order to um, advance in your OSPO journey. So thank you so much and um, welcome to OSPOCon.
interesting. Um, and maybe a little bit on Ospro Live as well. The first one is going to be in Sweden, but we're actually organizing them all across in Europe. So the next one is going to be in the Netherlands with our friends of Aliander. And I'm already working on organizing them well in Germany and in the UK. And actually since last night, probably France as well. Uh, so if you are interested in hosting an, an Ospology Live work session on your premises, just reach out to Anna and me. Uh, it's really the idea is basically that we're going to have Ospology Live sessions on a 90 to 120 day cascade in all various countries, making it easy for people to attend the event uh, because it's like a nice and low cost, which is also helpful with COVID. Uh, but it's really an in-depth knowledge sharing. Okay, let's start mind mapping. You, yeah. you want to do? Yeah. All right. Uh, so Anna and I are going to take a little bit about the, uh, the OSPO mind map that um, uh, we have at uh, to do. Yeah. Um, I think this uh, is not necessary. You can you can go introduce yourself. <laughs> All right. So I'll, I'll introduce myself. Uh, so my name is Thomas Tienbergen. I was formerly at Here Technologies. Uh, now I'm at EPAM since April, and I basically help organizations with all things uh, regarding open source. Uh, literally, I help p companies that have an o that are just starting at building OSPO to OSPO that ha the companies that have like an OSPO for 10 years. I'm involved in a lot of communities. <laughs> People is always kind of confusing, but yeah. So yeah, I work on the software bill of material um, um, SPDX. So I lead the security profile including vulnerabilities in SBOMs. I work on the, 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 the tooling on ORT, so that's basically how you can automate your open source policy. Uh, I work, of course, do work in Todo. Uh, I do work in Open Chain Lily. I was, the simply said, I run my OSPO the open source way. So wherever possible, I basically go out to the communities and work with them as I progress, basically, in my OSPO. Uh, because really, there is, in my way, doing it the open source way is the way to run your OSPO. It's good for your company, it's good for uh, the people in involved, and it's good for the community. Yeah, yeah so this is going to be the index we will be following today. So the first question is, okay, why creating an OSPO mind map? Like, how, how everything has started here, right? Um, so as some of you know, there are a lot of OSPO benefits. Um, people and organizations are now jumping into how to build an OSPO and let's build an OSPO uh, because they've seen it's beneficial for the culture because it helps to break the cultural gap between traditional software development practices and the uh, requirements for open source development nowadays. Uh, it also uh, is education, so can improve in technical mentorship and also training across all different teams in our organization. Uh, it can also help the to automation of tools and it improves continually. So many OSPOs maybe they start and suddenly because they, they are unable to uh, find the value and serve the value of the organization, um, they, they just disappear. So. Sorry, I, I said an OSPO, an open source uh, initiative. So an OSPO that is a centralized place to catalyze these open source efforts might be a way to uh, improve this continuity. So let's see, it's uh, from moving, as we said in the keynote, uh, from open source ad hoc to strategic decision making planets. But when people start in their OSPO journey, when organizations ha, uh, decide to give the fundings to, to build an OSPO or similar open source initiatives, there are many questions. And some of the, the key questions uh, that I've heard uh, over the past uh, years is, what roles and responsibilities does an OSPO have? Because it's really difficult to navigate uh, since there are uh, really, um, they have so many different, um, they have to pivot and so many different angles, it's kind of difficult. Because OSPOs are diverse and they are multidisciplinary and they are responsible of multiple tasks related to open source. So in order to try to help the community with this big issue, uh, I initially think about, okay, um, how can we break down the big picture of all the things an OSPO could do. 
So initially, I I started um, a really early version of the OSPO mind map. If I, I think I don't can even call it a version uh, that was mainly to understand better all the different uh, OSPO tasks and behaviors and roles in in the ecosystem. And I just share it on LinkedIn and Twitter, and suddenly a lot of people started to give me feedback and saying, uh, we really need that as a project where people can collaborate and have it open source in a transparent way because uh, this is something really available and can help a lot the, the OSPO community. So once I heard that, I created a, a GitHub discussion in the, in the uh, OSPO forum uh, to request create a new repo to work together on an OSPO mind map. So it was actually quite funny that so I hadn't missed the initial announcements, but we I said I'm on the to-do group steering committee and basically the, the the mind map came up and I was like, hang on, hang on, I have been working on my own mind map. It's a little bit bigger than all two. It's really where open source touches every bit in the organization, from security to procurement. And I had built this big mind map where it's like and I was using it basically to explain to people like, okay, these are kind of the roles and responsibilities. So then I was like, hang on, I have this thing, we already have this in to do. I just not contribute and, and emerge them. And so my work basically was based on my own experiences and work that basically uh, Ibram had done for, for many, many years. So I, least, I was literally taking all kinds of Linux Foundation uh, research papers, taking bits out of that, and I was just looking like, okay, how can I just make a new mind map, make it easy for people to understand what the roles are responsible for for an So yeah, once I found the 1.0, I was like, well, <laughs> let me make a pull request. And then really, as you can see, when well, I open it, then of course uh, other OSPO, so uh, Gregor, Gregor Lee, uh, uh, Joseph, they also were like, hey Ron, I, 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 wanna, I also know some things, we can make this better. So then basically as a community, we basically came together and basically we worked on it till we came to the 2.0 release. Um, so yeah, and this is really the nice thing about how we're working to do, basically again, you contribute back Others are like, oh, hang on, did you think about this? Did you think about it? And together we basically create something that we all can use. So the major update has been from 1.0 to 2.0 is that we more clearly define the, the, the OSPO responsibilities. So that we, um, because basically the, the, we had it in 1.0 clearly, but it's like, no, 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 there are actually more things in the OSPO. So to be, to be clear, it's not that we're saying an OSPO should do everything here. Every OSPO is different. It's just these are the things that an OSPO could do. And these help you kind of like structure and communicate, uh, for instance, to your management, like how, what, it could, what it could be done. So as it's about, this is how you can use the mind. So in your own organization, and, and I've been using it in, in EPAN as well, this is what I use to basically to talk to basically people that have no clue about open source or, uh, or basically are not, uh, our technical know about open source, but want to understand what, what value does an OSPO bring. So exactly by using the mind map, I can select, oh, these are all the topics that we work on. We already have this, this, and this. I also use it actually uh, between organizations. And there's always like, okay, so what do you do in OSPO? Every organization has their own little language. They call things differently. So I talk to a lot of my clients and they have a particular structure. And then I use the mind map to basically say like, Okay, so how do you oversee compliance? And then they just draw the line, okay, we have these people here, do see So we, we, get a, we get a common language. But that's also happening in, in, in the community. So again, I work on many different communities. I talk to open, uh, in OpenSF, I work a lot with the security people. And they don't necessarily understand what an OSPO does. But then I use the mind map and say like, look, this is how we do, this is how it's going So it helps to kind of create a common language e between even open source communities on what to do. Because again, you have to understand, not everybody knows what an open source program office does and how, how it works together. So that's kind of how you can um, use the, the mind map. Let's uh, show the thing in action. So let's do. So I said, um, it, the idea is you can go to the URL above. So it's uh, lostpromindmap.todogroup.org, and you basically get uh, the, the division in four blocks. So that the roles, behaviors, the size, and and and, and the responsibilities. Maybe let's start with uh, the roles. 
So here you see again all the things an OSPO could do. It said it's from, from, from project management to licensing. I said, remember the stages in the previous presentation on where people are? This, is, this kind of follows exactly the same. Again, we have, we've worked on aligning all of the stuff. And so this is what OSPO. The next thing you can look at, what is the behavior? Again, you have OSPOs that really work on industry collaboration, and that's the sole thing they do. The compliance bit is done, done some, somewhere else. Um, you have OSPO, you have OSPOs that do it also on like to to um, technology strategies. So y you really have different things then, and <laughs> well, people that have been longer in to do notice, we have on and off question. Okay, how big should my OSPO be? <laughs> do I have? We have uh, people that have an OSPO that are one-man armies. Uh, we have people that have an OSPO that, well, the largest that I know is about 30 plus people. Uh, so really, it really depends. And finally, as we said, the overview um, of the responsibilities, you can click basically on every bit. So and I would say pick one. And you can see, for instance, like, hey, how are we going to work with, how, we can we, how do we basically promote more upstream work? Well, you can uh, set up educational programs, and then you can click it out again, and then you see, like, hey, good hygiene, et cetera. So this is how it works. And there's also links in the under that so you can actually click to the material. So it, it really helps you guide and navigate to all of the uh, materials that are out there. OK, uh, so I we will also like to uh, give you um, some guidance on how to contribute to this project, because this is open source, and uh, it's and uh, the, uh, the Judo community is already keep working on the next version. Um, so uh, for this, uh, we will need to introduce you the tool. The tool we are using is called MarkMap. So it's a kind of friendly format uh, to um, ease community contribution contributions because it's just simply Markdown. You don't need really to to learn have coding skills to contribute to that. You just need to know Markdown, and uh, it uh, uh, um, develops uh, this nice and beautiful. Uh, uh, mark maps, mind maps. Um, the project, by the way, it's also open source project. I think it was uh, GPL, uh, the license. So, um, and then uh, on top of that, there is the project structure. So it it is uh, it has a content folder that includes the mind map as markdown file, and is where people can add their contributions and their additions to the mark map. There is an image folder. Uh, where it contains the vector image that is rendered uh, with from the uh, markdown file, and then the interactive mind map. And uh, there is additional info folder that contains like how this is started, like the story we, we have served. Um, and there is also some useful links that you will be able to find in the, in the slides um, in case you're interested to contribute. And the workflow to contribute is pretty as many open source projects. So uh, you send a PR uh, with requested changes to the markdown file, and maintainer reviews the, uh, Aspology maintainer reviews the PR. Uh, we can approve it and, and merge it, um, or request changes. If we approve it, this is not something that we need to automate. So if people know, uh, if there are um, contributions on how to automate this process of once the markdown is done, uh, automatically, uh, the um, HTML is uh, rendered and updated, but right now we have to do it manually. So the same maintainer generates the HTML uh, mark map, make changes to the HTML file, and the changes will be visible as at OSPO main map uh, to the group dot org. Um, so I said, as I said, we welcome new contributors to contribute to this and other to the resources. Uh, if you go to to the group dot slash community, uh, you will get a nice onboarding um, um, onboarding list to get started into to the community. Also, we have a calendar where you will be able to see all the different meetings we have over the month and one of them is workday activities and usually we have for um, EMEA and APAC um, and AMR time zones. So usually in there is when uh, people, folks gather together and work on, on the mind map uh, next versions and upcoming versions. So you're welcome to join anytime. And uh, this OSPO mind map is part of a repo at the Twitter group called Ospology. 
So ospology is a mix of all together uh, for OSPO. So if uh, someone that uh, are starting are uh, willing to start their OSPO or thinking about how to build an OSPO and start in their advancing in their OSPO journey, they can go to Ospology and there they will find uh, several resources. They will find networking, spa networking spaces like community meetings, OSPO use case with Ospology, thanks to Ospology webinars, the OSPO mind map to know about the OSPO responsibilities and behavior that an OSPO can adopt. Um, they can ask questions in the OSPO forum that are the Ospology GitHub discuss discussions and uh, join to OSPO news uh, that uh, gives an overview of what has been going on in, in the OSPOverse over the past month. Um, do you want to talk about this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, why I have slides? So actually, is that we're, Anna and I are organizing Ospology Life. And funny enough, we, uh, Ospology Life, for the people that don't know, it's, it's a two-day workshop event. One day is presentation, the second day is kind of an uh, unconference style where we have, like, we work together on the challenges that OSPO have. So in these sessions, we're actually going to use the OSPO mind map to guide the discussions. So we can use it to cluster all the various topics that people want to talk about it. So we can basically say like, oh, there's a group that wants to see about overseeing compliance. There, there is a group that wants to talk strategy. So this is, again, we're using the things that we develop in our own workshop. Because again, again, it helps to facilitate conversations between people. That's it. If you want to learn uh, more about to do, you can find in our presentation all of the social media links, all the links to the pods. Do we have still some time for questions? Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes? Hi. I hope it's not a big off topic, but I come from a company that doesn't have an OSPO, but uh, I'm interested in the data engineering and consulting sort of thing. Do you have some cheat sheets on how to convince a company in a certain regard that, for example, <laughs> let's say, who is that? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to repeat the question for the audience that it's uh, online. So you uh, are asking how to convince the organizations to build an OSPO and how to uh, see OSPO open source, open source how to convince your boss to build, uh, op to, to, to start engaging in open source and not just consuming it, but contribute back. Yes. Okay, um, so there are a lot of, different benefits. Um, so first of all, I think we mentioned in the keynote and is open source is everywhere right now. And even though you are not taking care of consuming it, uh, of uh, contributing back, you're consuming or your developers are consuming open source. And if you're doing that without um, any thinking of, okay, uh, I'm just taking it and not giving back, uh, that can take potential risk, security risk, and uh, big damage for the organizations. So um, there are many approaches to uh, justify the value of, of contributing back to open source, but I think this is, for private organizations, the most um, key one, like uh, the highlighting the security vulnerabilities of not contributing back to open source. Um, also, it can drive innovation. So uh, you're using open source, uh, but maybe if you contribute back and you engage in the community, uh, you can uh, start uh, getting into the community and maybe part of, um, you, you can have voice in, in the ecosystem. So that can also accelerate innovation and uh, might if you really invest in OSPO talent, in open source talent, and have maintainers and people 
uh, in in this open source community, you can the the organizations can even reduce cost. So there are so many different benefits. And uh, the next step of just not using just not about contributing to open source, but having a dedicated team is that if you really care or if the organizations really sees this risk and really cares of open source, um, you, the, the organizations will be putting efforts on that, will be investing. If not, they are not caring about that. That is not serious. So NOSPO is that way too. It's when organizations goes um, and says, okay, it's time for me to invest on it, to have a dedicated team or a dedicated um, time uh, of a group of people working on that because this is serious because uh, if not, I'm going to be behind. I'm, I'm going to get behind. My competitors are going to go ahead because they will be engaging in open source and, and, see, and uh, try to understand how to do smart open source and you're going to get behind. So that is a big issue usually for when you talk with many boss and um, managers. So to, to add what Anna said, I actually get that question on a regular basis. Um, if you want to get some hard facts, um, I actually happen to build tooling that you can run over your entire company's code repository and show you exactly how much open source you're using. And it's fully 100% open source. It will show you exactly which open source you're using, which license you have. It's not well, not maybe as is good enough. So don't expect like uh, like deep commercial grade that tooling that you normally have to pay a hundred thousand to a million bucks for. But basically, it's the same tooling that was basically developed under to, under also under the to do group by several German uh, automotive ospos that were basically like, okay, we see this question over and over. Have yes, we have the materials that you can use to make a nice PowerPoint presentation, and you can quote industry numbers are that like 80 to 90 percent of the stack but now we can have also have tooling that you can run so you just need to yeah have some compute power that you can use and then you can scan literally i've did it for my own company we scanned 19,000 code repositories and we just show the boss like hey <laughs> this is all the open source you're using uh, we actually used it for to hone our open source strategy so then we knew like okay from these are the most uh, build tools that are mostly used, so these are the most loose languages. So we can then focus. Okay, this is where we, as an as a company, should invest in. These are the communities important to us, um, and hopefully soon, ish, we will also be able to figure out like where are the weak spots in our infrastructure. So where are the packages what we call uh, dependency robustness. So where in my stack are the packages where the community can actually use some help. The German government is currently forming one. Uh, I'm also, and I'm also talking to the, the Dutch government since I'm being meeting Dutch. So in the Netherlands, it's currently that several of the ministries are forming us, but it's not yet a central one. But at least, for instance, like the Interior Ministry, they're working hard to 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 find our spots. It's in government things are always a little bit more complicated, but you are seeing now that they they recognize the importance of open source, and they're now basically shaping it. Um, but don't only think the government, also think cities. Like uh, the city of Amsterdam actually has an OSPO. Uh, city of Paris also has an OSPO. Uh, the the French Jean Marie also has an OSPO. <laughs> so it's a little at every layers in the in the public sector. Basically, you see basically OSPO is popping up. Yes, corporations were first to it that they have more of them. Uh, but you, yeah, again, also in the public sector, they they see the value of having an OSPO. And I would say also that uh, I've seen a lot of work in progress OSPOs or even organizations that um, from the public sector that they don't feel confident on s of calling it an OSPO yet. So they call it open source um, center of excellence or they don't even want to call it anything. We have, um, in fact, we have a, in Tudor Group an OSPO landscape. If you search uh, OSPO landscape, you will see an overview of all the OSPO adopters that in a public way they say we have an OSPO. Because as I said, I know a lot of OSPOs that they are there, uh, but they, they, f they don't want to share the brand or uh, they don't feel confident to see it. 
And there's also OSPOS, so th there has been, at least in Europe, uh, from I'm from Spain, uh, by the way. So in, in the uh, public sector in education, I've seen um, early states OSPOS that they don't call it an OSPO in universities. And they have been there for over the past decade, but they, they, they didn't call it an OSPO. They've been there silence. Um, so I hope that now that uh, we have this common definition of the OSPO, uh, more organizations that initially they started to do something similar to that, align on common um, definition and characteristics and, and, and we have like better alignment with, with this because there, they have been this hidden um, open source initiative somewhere and um, there's a lot more to discover. But yeah, so this is also why, um, well, one of the one of the reasons for me also when I was working on creation of Ospology Life. So this is the nice thing, like because we're now going to do local Europe events. Um, the people that normally don't come to a conference like this, because it's local, literally, is that well, some European countries are bigger than others. But I said I had a discussion in the Netherlands, like, okay, if we do it in Amsterdam, the furthest away is like a train, is like three and a half hours by train. The train ticket costs maybe forty bucks. That's something that you can easily find. So what we want to do is we want to get, by organizing Ospo Life, also get people that, that don't call themselves on Ospo, give them a forum to basically say where they can just go to us. oh, hey, I'm uh, sure I'm actually working on this. There's now an event that's like in the next city over. Can I have the train ticket uh, to just go there? So again, going to conferences, it may be not affordable for, for everybody, but by having it locally, so it's, again, it's small-sized locally, uh, but in-depth knowledge sharing. We, so what we do is we basically bring, so the, for the first one in, in Sweden, uh, where uh, David A. Wheeler from OpenSSF is coming in, uh, Shane um, from OpenChain is coming in. So we're literally bringing people that those people will normally never see because they won't necessarily be then, into the same room. And the idea is to basically so help them shape their, shape their OSPO. So just not, they can, again, they use their public material, but there's lots of things that you learn by talking to other OSPOs. Although so the, the idea is to basically, it's under chat and mouse rules, so you can publicly, openly speak and talk with others that also work in OSPO. And then in all the European countries, we hope to get this all kicked off to basically have people work together. And then hopefully we'll have, say, a Dutch OSPO community. We'll have a French OSPO community. We have a, a, Sp a Spanish OSPO community. And, <laughs> and so who knows, maybe in, in a couple of years, this room will be too big because we have so many OSPOs that, yeah. We'll need to hire a football stadium. Hopefully, then that's uh, that's where we're going for. So that's why I said uh, we're really trying to build this up and basically get the knowledge sharing, uh, um, get the knowledge going. Um, for the people that worry, yeah, we're starting in Europe. We already have requests to do it also in India and also in the U.S. So, <laughs> but let us first let Anna and I first get the Europeans come on going, and then we'll start doing uh, the other co the other continents. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, OSPO case studies in the website, and also uh, we have every single month we launch OSPOlogy webinars, uh, where we invite OSPO leaders across different regions and sectors uh, to talk about uh, OSPO experiences, like maybe they develop a new tooling or a new initiative, or they start their OSPO journey. So that is available uh, available in the OSPOlogy YouTube channel. Ospology, yeah, Ospology YouTube channel, and also in the um, uh, in the Tudor website, uh, uh, tudogroup dot org slash guides, yeah, slash guides, and there you will see all the different resources, um, and of course the Ospo landscape where you will find like an overview of uh, the Ospo ecosystem. Any, yeah.
Yeah. Uh, so the, the the question is, all the companies are doing basically license clearance, clearing the same open source packages, uh, because hey, everybody uses the same. Open source. So can we not uh, build a common pipeline where we do this, where we do where we do this work? Um, actually, yes. Um, actually, I'm already building it. <laughs> it's already being done in the German car industry, where basically we share this information. Um, we uh, we have the tooling already. Uh, we will also publish. Uh, well, we have already some, but there will be more. I'm about to push about 5,000 clearance results that I have from uh, my previous company that we cleaned up. So, uh, it, so what we're now doing is we're giving new OS posts. So the, the topic of compliance is usually the, for a lot of OS was the first topic. And a lot of them, people are either buying a tool and then they're not happy, and it's because there's basically there's gap in commercial, there's gaps in open source. Uh, but a lot of the people are like, compliance is very, very complex. So we said, like, okay, w um, I would love to have people more contributing, but compliance basically pulls down a lot of false posts. It's so complicated they can be assumed for like years. So we said, like, well, that's op let's fix this. So we open source the tooling, we open source the data. And we're also giving you the reference policies. So we're giving you the open source policies uh, that you can use to build upon. Basically giving you a full, everything that you need to basically do compliance out of the box for your developers. And, but again, that doesn't solve the problem of doing license clearance. Because again, there's literally millions of open source packages with unclear li uh, licensing. So I have, a, I'm actually a co-founder of another project called Clearly Defined. We, the number stats there says that about, f depending on the ecosystem, it can go up to 40% of all open source packages in an ecosystem were unclearly licensed. We need, to fi we need to fix this. Our way to fix this was like, no, 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 we're not gonna be as companies to maintain a database and we're gonna share this. We're gonna do this for the things that were released. We wanna fix things upstream. So that's why the tooling that I'm a co-developer on, um, it's fully open source. The idea is basically uh, that we give this to the community and um, we have now already our first success. So the Eclipse Foundation is gonna adopt OSS Toolkit or ORT, and they're gonna use it to check all uh, Eclipse packages, that's the idea. And then they will produce S-bombs. And the, they will also contribute back to the project, sharing the clearance data. It's really, like I said, I remember being in an open chain meeting a few years back, and basically in the room, I think, I think it was like 90% of the people were all doing the same clearance for the same open source package. It's like, it doesn't make sense. Literally, let's, let's, we are not competing <laughs> on license clearance unless you're a vendor. We're not competing. It's just cost for us. It's just something that we need to do. That's why let's share. I do know it takes a lot of time and a lot of convincing for people to say like, yeah, you actually clear this. Um, but again, we don't share companies' opinions about licenses. We just share the fact that <laughs> they, MIT is applicable to this license. And the nice thing, it's, it's open source, so we already had one case, there was a package where it was unclear what the license was. Because it was open source, I literally just reached out to Red Hat and say like, hey, one of your guys contribute there, it's unclear what the licensing is. And he was like, oh yeah, I can find this out. Here you have the main, like some really random main list, <laughs> where it's like, oh yeah, here you can see we actually mean this. And then the original contributor, who still was working for Red Hat, actually contributed back and say like, this license actually means this. So we then also had the full provenance. Like normally as an OSPO, trying to figure out what the developer meant, what the things, it, it takes many, many hours. Doing this the open source way is for me the way, because again, it's the open source community, fixing things upstream. And it has some other benefits when we roll out this, to this tooling. Again, the problem was for me always, corporations using commercial tooling, they figure things out, they clear things up, but they usually don't fix it upstream. So then the next corporation has, has, a, has to do exactly the same clearance. So this is why um, uh, I'm very grateful that like, we're, we're cleaning this up. And there's also other related space. So the Free Software Foundation Europe has something called re Reuse. And that's a specification that you can use as a developer to clearly indicate like with an SPX license identifier, this is the license applicable to the code. So instead of saying, uh, like writing it out and, and people write, all kinds of things there. My favorite sentence in clearance is, MIT is compatible with GPL. Yeah, a scanner doesn't understand that. All the scanner sees is GPL. And a lot of uh, my clients say, GPL, big, big no-no. That means that every time a developer writes that in their source code, uh, the scanner will flag it. A better way would be to just add your code to say, SPDX license identifier, MIT. It's human readable, and it's machine readable, and it's instantly clear. So the in the Linux Foundation, there are big efforts. For instance, uh, the Linux kernel 
has a lot of now SBDX license values. So it's very clear that if you use the Linux kernel and you have to do clearance for that, you can literally now much more easier figure out what the license was because for, and you're talking about, we're talking about thousands of source files. Now proper SBDX license IDs have been added to clarify like exactly what was the licensing for this file. Any final questions? So you're t you're let me repeat the question for, for online. So does the to-do group have some guidance about uh, SBOM tooling, basically, right? Um, it's not under the to-do group. We are linking to it. So again, this is why we collaborate with all, the, all, all, all other groups. So most of the work in the SBOM worker group, this is actually happening in a SPDX because that's the ISO standard for SBOM, and in, in OpenChain, it's a compliance problem. So Again, we don't as to do. We don't want to have everything on the there. If there are already existing communities that are doing great work, we'll just link to them, and they say here you can find them. What we will work on uh, is the to do group, and what we have materials by like I like, said, so, hey, the actual details of those things are over there. If you how you can use this in an OSPO setting, that will be on the to do group, right? Because that's really where the OSPO context where we say like, hey, this is how you could use it in, in an OSPO. Yeah, and I just wanted to add that uh, part of uh, one of the, the missions I've, uh, we've been working with the steering committee um, has been uh, how to build this cross-community collaboration across other communities. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, we recently uh, joined OpenSSF to work on how, um, how to give guidance on OSPOs on how to build uh, open, uh, more open source uh, secure projects and having this guidance targeted to OSPO and focus it on um, an organizations that are uh, building an OSPO. So this is a clear example of how can we collaborate with other communities because OSPOs are being everywhere. And as we said, all the, there's a lot of responsibilities that deals with legal, with compliance, but also with community building, with um, assessing the metrics and strategy to measure the success uh, that is, for instance, uh, measuring community health. Uh, Chaos does a great work as well. So all this, uh, it's, it's useful information, and it's already there. It's already in the communities. The main, um, the, the, the key part of this is how can we uh, collaborate and, and share knowledge. Even within, I know it's everything about open source, but sometimes it's, it's difficult to to connect and to communicate even within uh, all the open source communities and peers. Uh, so I think also one of the main um, reasons of building this Ospology Live, as Thomas was saying, is to uh, put everyone together into a single room and build common tooling and build common resources. Yes? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, just for the online audience, uh, they were saying that they have been using this OSPO mind map to dig, deep dive into all the responsibilities uh, and um, formalize better all the different responsibilities and select which ones are relevant for their organizations based on their organization's goals, I guess. And uh, thank you so much for all the community uh, to, to keep this project alive and keep contributing to it. And yes, one last stop. Okay, you, you can. We we can chat. I mean, we will be around. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>